வெல்கம் ஸ்வாகதம் வணக்கம் இன் திஸ் வீடியோ ஐ சீக் டு ஷேர் வித் யூ அன் இன்சைட் தட் ஐ ஜஸ்ட் ஹேப்பன் டு டிரைவ் ஃப்ரம் எ ராதர் ப்ரொட்ராக்டட் சீரீஸ் ஆஃப் மெடிடேஷன்ஸ் ஆன் அ பர்டிகுலர் வேர்ஸ் விச் ஃபார்ம்ஸ் பார்ட் ஆஃப் வாட்ஸ் நவ் ஃபேமஸ் ஆஸ் அ சர்மன் ஆன் த மவுண்ட் in particular the gospel of matthew chapter 5 verse 20 <clears throat> the verse reads as follows truly truly i say to you unless your righteousness that is to say your sense of justice unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and pharisees you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of god obviously i'm using the king james's version that's why the word righteousness uh, exists in that text modern translations would use the word justice instead um till about say 20 30 years ago it was customary to refer to god's justice as righteousness and and man's justice as justice so there was a distinction sort to be underlined using these two different words to denote two different categories of justice i repeat god's justice is or was referred to as righteousness and man's justice is justice so in this text uh, the word used is righteousness in modern translations it would be justice now what challenged my thinking for a long time not just for one or two months or one or two years for a long time how is my my righteousness or your righteous to exceed the righteousness of scribes and pharisees because if you ask the scribes and pharisees they would tell you that no one can exceed their sense of godly justice and if you ask any christian even today he or she will tell you the no one can exceed the sense of justice of the priestly class the priest the bishop <clears throat> so much so in the christian community is it is deemed dogmatic or axiomatic that criticizing members of the priestly class is an unforgivable sin <clears throat> just the other day somebody contacted me an elderly doctor who has a very commendable track record in what's called mission and evangelism he contacted me to make a request the request that i use my influence with a particular youtube channel to shut up its mouth against speaking about the corruption of a particular bishop so i asked him whether the channel was spouting falsehood but the anything that the channel has reported is factually incorrect he hesitated for a while and he said that he was not aware of any factual contradiction but he was simply perturbed that such things are said about priests and bishops so that's why i'm saying and i can cite many many instances it is a kind of a superstitious belief with i suppose with all religious communities that their priestly class ought to be held on a pedestal and that no criticism however factually justified uh, should be allowed or undertaken <clears throat> well i don't believe in it i feel the truth must be spoken irrespective of who is rendered uncomfortable by it, but that's uh, as an aside <clears throat> now here uh, jesus is stipulating what seems to be an exalted standard of justice the justice of ordinary people he says must exceed the righteousness of the justice of the priests and the pharisees uh, they are of course <clears throat> very highly distinctive as well as distinguished um, priestly hierarchies as you know <clears throat> in fact the pharisees though strictly speaking not belonging to the levi which is the priestly class priestly tribe they were the real pillar of the jewish religion <clears throat> so uh, this teaching now i used to sort of struggle within myself as 
to understand what does this mean in real terms. Now, I think I have a better understanding of the text and I just can't wait to share this insight with you. <clears throat> and I plead for your patient participation in, the, in this process of unraveling the meaning of this otherwise rather difficult, even obscure text. <clears throat> the first thing I want to say is something that Christians are completely unaware of, perhaps by choice, uh, uh, if not by default. Jesus had a profound historical sense. He was aware of the evolution of the human species, that is, the various changes that humankind has undergone over the centuries. He was not a very naive, innocent, uh, ignorant kind of person that Christians believe him to be. Jesus was extremely thoughtful, he had an inquisitive mind and he steeped himself to the best of my knowledge with the best that was thought and known in the world in his days. So he had a very profound historical sense. And I'm going to use something of that historical sense in unpacking the meaning of this otherwise obscure teaching by Jesus. Now, if you look at the history of the evolution of human sense of justice, you will actually see three stages. And it's important that these three stages are clearly understood and demarcated. In the first stage of the evolution of our sense of justice and our moral sense, it was the law of force that prevailed. Might was right. So the sense of justice that prevailed then was entirely determined by who the really powerful person or powerful or dominant group was. For example, if a powerful tribe conquered a powerless tribe and despoiled their wealth and uh, made them slaves, there was no moral repugnance attached to it, rather their victory was celebrated. And in fact, it was felt that the, vang the, the, the victorious were in the good books of God. And it was keeping in this in mind that Napoleon, of all people, said that God is always on the side of the largest battalion. God is always on the side of the largest battalion. He was being sarcastic about it, or as well as being historically realistic. Now, for example, if you launch yourself into a war and you have only thousand soldiers with you, uh, armed and equipped rather poorly, and you're pitting yourself against an army of 10,000 highly trained and um, uh, properly heavily equipped army, then the chances are that you lose. Though in the Old Testament, you have stirring accounts of uh, the Jews winning many battles in spite of their gross numerical inferiority. They always said that God fought their battles and won victories for them which is a perspective to what extent that is literally true is a matter of opinion. Now therefore, in olden days, the principle to remember is that might was right and therefore the sense of justice was almost entirely decided on the scale of right, for example, uh, or scale of might. For example, during the Middle Ages in Europe, all over Europe, there was a custom called the joust, J-O-U-S-T. Now, I'll briefly explain what the joust meant. Suppose a person was insulted by another of the same rank, of the same rank, uh, even otherwise. What that person would do is to challenge the person who insulted him to a duel. And it was assumed that the person who won the duel was the right or, or the person who had the right on his side. And the other person lost because he was in the wrong. So it's a clear illustration of the principle of the morality of force, the morality of might. Might is right. And in this context, justice was a matter of might. Might is right. 
And now, for example, uh, even today, even today, the tribals in our country are ill-treated. And this is, of course, known. And it doesn't really affect or torment our conscience because the tribals, as compared to the rest of us, are culturally powerless, economically powerless, politically powerless. So we have a kind of old world assumption working below the level of our consciousness that if somebody is weak, somebody is insignificant, it doesn't matter if that person is denied justice. We all remember Father Stan Swami. He was arrested as an anti-national subversive element just because he identified himself with the struggles of the tribal people for justice, for the full implementation of the legal rights envisaged for the tribals as per the Indian constitution. He was not asking for anything else. Tribals are given special rights as per, I think, the eighth schedule of the Indian constitution. But these rights are never implemented. On the other hand, in the interest of development, tribes are displaced from their habitat, uh, creating enormous human suffering. By rough calculation, I remember reading somewhere that uh, between 1947 and 1997, in the 50-year period, more than uh, one crore uh, 18 lakhs tribals have been displaced from their habitat in the name of development. They are called PAP, Project Affected People. And only one third of them have been rehabilitated after a fashion till 1947, talking about a 50 year period. That's the level of injustice that's perpetrated in the name of development. Even today, if uh, it's found that uh, the, uh, the region inhabited by a tribal people is rich in ore and that can bring in mega wealth to a corporate, they will enter into a, an agreement with the government and the government would then be a party to displacing um, the, the tribals or taking the land away from the tribals and, and giving it to the, corp the corporates. So anyway, uh, might is right. So the might of the corporates is their economic might. The might of the politician is their political might. Now take the case of religion. It is impossible to get justice against a bishop or archbishop or a card cardinal within a church, any church. I have personal experience in this matter. I don't know a single instance in which a common believer sought justice against a priest, a, a bishop, archbishop, cardinal, even a priest, and got it from the church. What is it that makes a difference here? It is the power of religion, the priestly power, which cannot be questioned. So no matter which manifestation of power we are talking about, the old sense of justice was that might is right. This has to be, this is the earliest, crudest form of justice. Now comes the second stage, which is the morality of generosity and chivalry. The morality of generosity and chivalry. For example, in this phase, it was understood, it was assumed, though not, not always implemented, uh, let's take the example of uh, the slave labor, slave, slave labor, such as it uh, flourished in Europe and mostly in North America and the so-called Bible Belt. Now, a slave owner, the master of the slave, had absolute possession of the slave. He could do what he wanted with the slave, including taking the life of the slave. But after a while, it began to be recognized, this was largely because of uh, the Christian work in these regions, that slaves are also human beings. Till then it was assumed that slaves were like animals and animals were assumed not to have souls and therefore it did not matter how uh, uh, slaves were treated. In fact, the tragic story of how the European settlers in the American uh, uh, continent, North American continent, 
systematically eliminated the local indigenous people, the Red Americans, and a theological justification for this was in, in, invented by the missionaries who said that the local people, to the extent that they were alien to the Christian faith, lacked a soul and therefore they were equal to animals and therefore it did not matter if they were exterminated. All these things have happened in the history of Christianity and there's no point in denying this. It's not wisdom nor is it a sense of human dignity to hide or bury our head in the sand of ignorance. All these things have happened. Tremendous atrocities were perpetrated in various parts of Africa, particularly South Africa. The Dutch Reformed Church created apartheid and theological justifications were invented to justify and perpetuate apartheid. Just as religion was used in, in the Indian context to justify and perpetuate the caste system. So everywhere, all over the world, religion is abused in this sense. So uh, there was the sense of uh, uh, a justice that transcended that justice, namely that slaves began to be recognized as human beings and therefore they were also entitled to certain level of protection and the uh, merciful treatment and, and merciful treatment by, at the hands of their master. That's a great leap forward. Though now when we look back on all these things, we may not understand the full gravity of this change. From, imagine the condition of a slave who is not entitled to any help or charity or merciful treatment at the hand of his master, suddenly entering a phase in which it begins to be recognized that he is also a human being and therefore he is entitled to be treated as a fellow human being even though his status as a slave will not change. So that's a leap forward in morality. But then the class difference still persisted. And equality, a sense of justice was confined to um, uh, how it would be practiced only among equals. For example, in the Indian context, in the class caste system, the laws applicable to Brahmins, the high caste, were not the same laws that applied to the lower castes. Those within the Brahminical class would be treated alike. They are entitled to the same level of justice. But a Mlecha, a person who belongs to a lower caste, would not be entitled to be treated on par with a Brahmin in the eye of justice. But equality was recognized within the same caste. So that's another improvement. It's not as crude as it seems to us today. It was a, an improvement of the previous system. Might is right. So some notion of equality is now coming in. Now think of another custom in Europe, chivalry, to which I have already made a reference. In this practice, knight errants, that is uh, men belonging to, uh, you know, well-to-do, upper middle class, sometimes even aristocratic families, went round with a romantic sense of the duty to redeem damsels in distress. That's how they meted out justice to women. So this class of people, uh, the gender of people, women were prioritized and in case they were being ill-treated, they were being um, uh, taken advantage, uh, advantage unfairly, unfairly of anyone, if they were subject to the brutality of might is right, then the knight would intervene and deliver justice to them. So that is chivalry. But that again is a leap forward. So at any rate, from being might is right, the idea changes. Now we have the morality of generosity and chivalry. Now we reach the third stage, which is the morality of equality, true equality. Now in this sense, uh, all human beings are treated as belonging to the same species. Now politically, all are citizens. Or and in monarchy, all are subjects to the king. And therefore, they are entitled to be treated alike in the eye of the law. Now, that's a huge leap forward. But what happened was that even though in theory, uh, 
all people were treated were to be treated alike in fact this remained the ideal and it never was realized in practice even today in spite of centuries of democratic evolution the fact remains that in the way law is practiced in this country and justice is administered a poor man stands hardly any chance against a very rich man if i have a case against ambani no matter how meritorious my case i'm sure to lose it there's no question about it you can't even criticize some adani or ambani you can criticize anyone you can criticize god but you cannot criticize adani or ambani without getting into serious trouble so that's the f- great reach of equality that we have reached so no matter what we say human beings are incapable of equality the same thing in religion everything else around religion changes but religion remains exactly as it was 1000 years ago 2000 years ago the disparity between the priestly class and the laity ordinary believers remains as wide as it was in the middle ages it will not change now it's keeping all this in mind that jesus says your justice must exceed all of this now the point is how can this happen when after millennia of human evolution this has not become possible what is the way forward jesus says the maximum sense of justice that human kind has attained is that justice must be available to people who are equal within their class now if there is a tussle between ambani and adani then uh, justice will prevail they'll be treated alike um maybe uh, adani will be preferred by modi therefore he may get a preferential treatment i don't know but this is speculation so which i want to avoid now how can this be avoided jesus says there's only one way and that is true equality based on love must become the order of the day as of now society political structure governance justice delivery system everything social stratifications institutions everything is predicated on power and as long as humanity stands rooted in this paradigm of power inequality is uh, unavoidable inescapable and so long as inequality remains justice will always remain aborted that is why thousands and thousands tens and thousands of people languish in our indian jails about 75 to 80 percent of the inmates in our jails numbering tens and thousands of them are waiting for their trials to begin and they have been waiting for five to ten years for petty crimes terrible injustice is being done to them but nobody is bothered about it because they don't matter if a rich man is arrested for a few hours that that will become big news if a poor man is arrested and put in put behind bars for flimsy accusations and he remains there for five years seven years ten years nobody bothers this is as far as the worldly sense of justice can go jesus says you must exceed the righteousness of the pharisees and the scribes and the righteousness of the courts of law also the sense of justice as it prevails today even the best practice of justice in the world is not good enough if to exceed that and that is possible only by cultivating an outlook of the morality of love which is the morality of true equality and unless and until it is firmly established that all people have the same worth even though their social economic political stations will vary all people have undoubtedly the same worth then the sense of equality in the eye of law and the equal entitlement to justice will never become real and the only context in which the sense of equality of worth can be universally experienced and institutionalized is with reference to god it's only in the presence of god that all human beings have the same worth i dare say that the adanis and the abanis will not claim in the presence of god that they have greater worth than me or you i'm pretty sure about it they will tremble in their trousers before they th- uh, even think about it okay 
So, a sense of godliness. But according to Jesus, this sense of godliness is never safe and stable unless there's a culture of love. That's why Jesus taught his disciples and those who come after them to think of God as a heavenly father, meaning we must relate to God through love, even though the commandment has been there for centuries that God must be loved absolutely. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. No one really relates to God through love because we are all trained, nurtured in power. Power cancels love. Power suppresses love. And therefore, people don't really relate to God in love. We are from birth onwards trained to relate to God only in fear. And our religious practices, our piety, our scrupulous observance of all religious customs and practices are all driven by the fear that if we commit the slightest mistake in this, God will come down heavily upon us and reduce us to pulp. It's a religion of fear. And therefore, we fall far short of, short of the sense of justice. From my extensive experiences, I have to say this, the Christian community is terribly deficient in the sense of justice. Even though Jesus has prescribed for his followers a very exalted, unmatched sense of justice, <laughs> truly, truly, I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds, unless your sense of justice, your practice of justice exceeds the justice of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of God. So I, I suppose this sort of very quick historical survey has provided us a little window of insight into the tremendous scope that Jesus envisaged in a simple or very pithy aphoristic teaching like this. And the same goes for all his teaching. Unfortunately, the notion that Jesus is an unlettered, <coughs> uh, innocent kind of a person has prevented Christians from entering into the depth the scope, the height and the reach of Jesus' uh, historical, spiritual historical sense. And I hope that changes and changes right soon. So thank you for your patient attention. All the very best.